I think it's time for us uh, to start. Um, I'm speaking to you again uh, from Lisbon and I hear the church bells uh, marking <laughs> that it's uh, nine o'clock here in Lisbon, so four o'clock in Singapore. Um, and it's a great pleasure uh, for me to welcome the participants uh, of the CILE Academy uh, to the first uh, guest lecture um, on the first week um, on the model um, international law making. We were together yesterday and we'll be together tomorrow again. But today we have the privilege, and I, I think it's really a privilege, uh, to have with us um, uh, Professor Tommy Koh, uh, who I will introduce in a moment, um, to speak to you about uh, the making of international law uh, reflection on Anaclaus and the Earth's Summit. That's the title for his lecture and he will explain that uh, no doubt in a moment. So Professor Tommy Koh, uh, some of you uh, have probably seen him in uh, action um, in uh, the launching round table uh, and to many of you he's no stranger. He's really one of the leading figures in uh, international law um, in Singapore but also um, worldwide. He's been uh, um, an active um, uh, uh, participant in international lawmaking, as you will hear from him uh, this morning or this afternoon in Singapore. And he uh, is at the moment ambassador at large uh, for the Singapore Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and also very importantly for our academy, the chairman of the Center of, uh, for International Law of the National University of Singapore. Um, to uh, be very short, as uh, Professor uh, Tomiko has asked me on his introduction, I have to highlight uh, that he was president of the third um, United Nations Conference on the Law of the Sea, and he also chaired the preparatory committee um, and the main committee at the Earth Summit. So we have no better person uh, to speak to you about these topics and how international law was made um, also through his direct uh, action um, in these two important uh, conferences. So without further ado, uh, Professor Tommy Ko, um, it's really a pleasure to have you with us and also for all the support that you've given to the Academy. So you have the floor and yeah. then we'll have a debate with the participants. Okay. Uh, thank you, Patricia. And uh, I'd like to also greet Nilufa and once again, to congratulate the two of you for launching this uh, initiative. Um, my talk this afternoon or this morning in Europe is on the making of international law with a personal reflection on UNCLOS and the 1992 Earth Summit. But let me begin uh, with a different point. The first point I want to make is that it is important for us who are international lawyers to take every opportunity to explain to members of the public and even to lawyers that although different from domestic law, international law exists and to explain how it is applied in practice. I say this because some years ago, I was very surprised when the president of my country and the chief justice of my country said to me uh, separately that there was no such thing as international law. I asked them in return, what law, if not international law, was applied by the International Court of Justice and the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea in deciding two disputes between Singapore and Malaysia. They couldn't answer my question. I then uh, said half in jest that I had helped to develop some new international law. So my talk this afternoon is, how did UNCLOS and the 1992 Earth Summit help to make new international law? Um, my, my second point is to refer to Article 38, Para 1, of the Statute of the International Court of Justice. 
as everyone knows, this paragraph sets out the four sources of uh, international law recognized by the court. And the first source is uh, treaties. The term treaty uh, is a generic term. It applies to both bilateral treaties and multilateral treaties. It also refers to conventions, covenants, charters, memorandum of understanding, exchange of notes, etc. So I want to cite two examples. The ASEAN Charter signed by the 10 heads of state and government of ASEAN in 2007 is a treaty. On the 3rd of October, 1990, the foreign ministers of China and Singapore signed a memorandum of understanding in New York, establishing diplomatic relations between our two countries. That memorandum of understanding is a treaty. So that's, that's what I want to say in explaining what the term treaty in the statute of the court means. I want to now move to the 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which is an example of a multilateral treaty. This treaty was very complex to negotiate and it took a total of nine years for us to conclude the conference. In the final two years of the conference, I was elected uh, as his president. Uh, today, UNCLOS is 168 parties. This indicates its wide acceptance. And interestingly, the United States argue that the provisions of UNCLOS have become part of customary international law. Therefore, the U.S. can benefit from the convention without being a party to it. UNCLOS is not a typical uh, treaty. And I want to mention three of its unique features. First, UNCLOS is not a codification treaty. It contains many new concepts of international law, such as the exclusive economic zone, streets used for international navigation, transit passage, archipelagic state, archipelagic sea lane passage, common heritage of mankind, etc. Second, UNCLOS, unlike some other treaties, does not allow for reservations. Why did we who drafted uh, the treaty decide against reservations? We decided against reservations because we were afraid that if we had allowed for reservations, then states party will cherry pick the provisions they like and uh, opt out of provisions that they do not like. This would have undermined the integrity of the convention. The third unique feature of UNCLOS is that the settlement of disputes which arise between two states parties on the interpretation and application of the convention is compulsory, not optional. You may ask why when we were negotiating the convention, we decided that disputes on the interpretation and application of the convention should be compulsory and not optional. We decided, again, that it was necessary to have a system of compulsory dispute settlement in order to preserve the integrity of the convention. Otherwise, there will be many different conflicting interpretations of what 
the convention mean? So what we have in part 15 of the convention is a system of compulsory dispute settlement. So when Singapore becomes a party to UNCLOS, it has given its consent to part 15. And another country, such as Malaysia, which has a dispute with Singapore on the interpretation and application of the convention, can unilaterally take Singapore to arbitration. It need not ask for our consent because our consent was given when we became a party. The convention does exclude some types of disputes from the system of compulsory dispute settlement. Article 297, paragraph two and three, exams, marine scientific research and fisheries. And Article 298 allows state parties to exclude three types of disputes. One, maritime delimitation, two, military activities, and third, matters before the UN Security Council. I want finally to answer a question <clears throat> that has often been posed to me. Is UNCLOS cast in stone or is it capable of accommodating new developments? <clears throat> My answer is that UNCLOS is not cast in stone and it is capable of accommodating new developments. So let me give you three examples. In 1994, the UN adopted an implementation agreement on part 11 of the convention. This was a legal innovation of the late Ambassador F uh, F Satya Nandan of Fiji. I've asked him in private whether this is legal, you know, he said, well, nobody's ever raised the question, so let's assume it's legal. The effect of this 1994 implementation agreement is to amend part 11 of the convention. And in 1995, the UN adopted another implementation agreement on straddling fish stocks and highly migratory species of fish. There is an ongoing conference on biodiversity beyond the limits of national jurisdiction. This conference is being chaired by a fellow Singaporean, Rena Lee. If the conference succeeds, and I hope it will, it will result in another a new implementation agreement. Which will, which will be adopted under UNCLOS. It, it complements, it, it augments the convention. Let me now leave UNCLOS and move to us, uh, the other topic, the Earth Summit. In 1972, the UN held its first major conference on the human environment. This was a landmark conference. And I was very privileged to have been a member of the preparatory committee for Stockholm. Unexpectedly, 18 years later, the UN elected me to chair the preparatory committee for the second conference, which will be held in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil in 1992. At the summit itself, the conference elected me to chair the main committee. In other words, 
I was put in charge of the negotiations at the conference. The 1992 Earth Summit was very successful and productive. It produced one, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, two, the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, CBD, and third, the Rio Declaration on Environment and Development. The UNFCC and the Convention on Biological Diversity are treaties. The Rio Declaration is not legally binding and is not a treaty. The interesting thing I want to share with you is that over time, some of the principles in that declaration have become new rules of international law. Let me refer to three of them. First, principle number 15 on the precautionary principle. It laws, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, has explicitly referred to this principle in its advisory opinion on the responsibilities and obligations of state. The precautionary principle has also been applied by it laws in some contentious cases, such as the case between Hungary and Slovakia, and in the provisional measure phases of the Southern Bluefin Tuna case, the Moxplan case, and the land reclamation case between Singapore and Malaysia. The second principle is principle number 16. The principle that the polluter pays. This principle has long been the subject of discussion between, uh, in, in judicial uh, fora. In recent years, this principle has found explicit and more robust application in regional context as well as in judicial decisions. The International Maritime Organization has adopted the polluter pay principle in several of its conventions. The third example is principle number 17 on the requirement for environmental impact assessment. The International Court of Justice has regarded this principle as a particular manifestation of a state's duty to exercise due diligence to prevent significant transboundary environmental harm. It has been applied directly in the certain activities case and the paper mill case. The importance of this principle uh, has also been uh, applied in environmental case, other environmental cases brought before the court, such as the Hungary versus Slovakia case I referred to earlier. So my concluding comment on this is that when I was drafting the real declaration in 1992, I thought I was drafting a, fund a political document. I did not realize then that some of the principles in that declaration would have a life of their own. And that over time, it will gain acceptance and grow to become new rules of international law. Let me now conclude my talk. Contrary to the skeptics, international law does exist. It provides the rules for cooperation between and among states in many areas of human endeavor. And it is of growing importance as the world become ever more interconnected 
and inter independent interdependent international law is not a static body of law it is organic is capable of growth and change it is augmented by treaties as well as new norms and customs which accept which attract general acceptance in my talk i referred to unclos as an example of a multilateral treaty it is however a rather unique multilateral treaty with some special features i've also referred to my work at the 1992 un earth summit and made the point that sometimes soft law can become hard law and that three of the 27 principles in the real declaration of environment and development have now been become accepted as part of customary international law i will conclude my remarks and look forward to your questions thank you thank you so much uh, professor tomiko for this uh excellent uh, first-hand um, account of uh, lawmaking. Uh, it's really a privilege um, to be able to hear from you um, and from your experience um, uh, with two um, very different examples of, uh, on the one hand, um, the negotiation of hard law of a treaty like UNCLOS and its uh, um, uh, special features. Uh, we all uh, are very aware of the importance of UNCLOS and how um, it is considered to be the constitution of the ocean. So it's really one of the core treaties um, and, and with many innovative uh, features like the ones that you mentioned, including the dispute settlement uh, mechanism. But at the same time, um, how um, international law um, is also made through sometimes a more sub subtle mm. process um, of soft law then evolving into hard law. It's actually a topic that we're going to explore in the lecture tomorrow, uh, but it's something that I'm actually personally very interested on. And, and I think actually at the moment, at the current moment, that's one of the ways that international law is developing more through the subtle matters yeah. because there are only a few examples of uh, um, big multilateral treaties being negotiated at the moment, including the BBNJ Treaty. Uh, but I don't want to um, uh, get too much into the details because I really want to invite um, our, our participants uh, to ask, to take advantage of this unique opportunity to have in your living room, in your homes, uh, which is, I mean, this digital world allows you to have a, a, a leading figure of international mm -hmm. law uh, in, in, in your homes, um, uh, to ask uh, uh, questions either um, by uh, raising your hands and, and uh, turning on the screen and, and asking your question live um, or through the chat. Um, so we have a bit of time. Uh, Professor Tomiko was extremely disciplined um, in his initial presentation, which was uh, very rich, but very concise and very clear. Uh, so we do have ample time for, uh, for discussion and for your questions. So please feel free. Um, uh, to raise your hand, I'll try to monitor uh, the screen as best, best as I can um, to see if I see any raised hands, um, uh, virtual raised hands, um, or through the chat. Um, so uh, please feel uh, free. Um, and and we have we do have a question, uh, in, initial question from. Uh, if I see right from uh, Nilfer, <laughs> which is great for breaking the ice. I had uh, one question in my pocket for breaking the ice, but I, I'm really glad. So I, I, I will ask Nilfer to pose your question live. I think that makes it much more interesting. And with that, maybe the participants will warm up and, yeah. and, and also follow suit. Nilfer, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I have to say, um, I echo your words, Patricia, to have uh, someone like uh, Professor Coe uh, with the experience in real live 
uh, lawmaking, the Law of the Sea Convention, uh, an incredible instrument. There's nothing really like it. And then I, I really, this is the first time I heard in detail your experience with the 1992 Rio Declaration. So this is wonderful. Uh, my question, and I think that um, it's always interesting what goes on in negotiations. And the Law of the Sea Convention, as you said, was quite unique. And if you could perhaps um, describe some of the challenges that, uh, that you saw in the, the, the negotiation process, and perhaps how those were overcome. Uh, if you could give some insight <laughs> to that aspect. Uh, thank you, Nilufa. That's, that's a big question. I think it deserves a separate lecture. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there, were, there were many challenges. The third UN conference on the law of the sea faced many challenges. The first challenge was that it started without a, a basic negotiating text, which was most unusual. You know, we wasted two years before we had a single negotiating text. So that was one. Second, it was a very comprehensive agenda. Our, our ambition was to write a comprehensive treaty governing all aspects of the oceans and its resources. And so it was a huge, very huge agenda. And so it, it took time, you know, to come to, to develop draft treaty articles, um, to apply to all these areas. So that's the second challenge. The third challenge was that we had to arrive by consensus on, on the, an agreement. So we refused to take vote. We wanted the, the product of our negotiation to be acceptable to everybody. So we try as far as we can to refrain from taking votes. So it was very, very strenuous. You know, it, it took, when you have 150 plus countries in a negotiation, it's not easy to always get a consensus, you know? So that was the third big challenge. And the fourth challenge was that there were so many competing interests, you know? It was a very unusual conference in that soon after it began, country began to identify what were their interests in the conference. And they began to form groups of like-minded colleagues. So we had many interest groups in the conference. So this added a new complication to the negotiating process. Uh, sometimes the negotiation was between two opposing groups in some other cases, it was more complicated than that. And, uh, and also this was during the Cold War. So you had two superpowers. So one of my challenges was how to get an agreement acceptable to the two superpowers on the other hand, the middle countries and then the developing countries. So that was another complication. So, so we faced many challenges. But we, we were very innovative. We created new methods of negotiation, uh, informal negotiating groups, intersessional meetings, and you know, all kinds of things. So the, the happy story is that after nine, nine strenuous years, we did come to an agreement. Thank you so much, Professor Ko. So we have now from the participants, Eugenia um, who, from Russia, uh, who is asking for the floor uh, for yeah. a live question. And then oh. I also see that we have two questions um, in the chat that I will pose afterwards. So uh, please, Eugenia, go ahead. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Professor Ko. I'm I'm so honored with the opportunity to in, indeed have um, an outstanding figure uh, in international law in my room <laughs> in Russia. Uh, so my question, and I'm sorry that I'm interfering with the questions about the negotiations of the uh, UNCLOS, uh, yeah. but my question is, um, well, I understand and I think I, I think it was a wonderful idea not to allow the 
state parties to make any reservations to the UNCLOS. Yes. But uh, was it uh, what resulted in the United States never ratifying the UNCLOS? Is it a great loss uh, that that country did yeah. not ratify the convention or is it compensated by uh, it having signed the convention, which yeah. also includes some obligations <laughs> under the Vienna Convention, but uh, <laughs> and, uh, and applying uh, customer international law? Yeah. So uh, would would it be um, would it still uh, is it still necessary for the development of the international law of the sea for the United States to also ratify this convention, or is it fine as it is? Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Eugenia, for asking this question. And I'm very happy to um, meet a friend from Moscow. It brings back happy memories of my two visits to your great country. Um, the United States is a very complicated country. And I say this, having spent almost 20 years of my life living in America, six of them as the Singapore ambassador to the United States. It's a complicated country. It has many interests. And uh, also the, the method by which they ratify a treaty is complicated in that the administration can sign the treaty, but the Senate may refuse to ratify it. You know? In the case of UNCLOS, the United States never signed it. So the United States they neither signed nor ratified it, and initially, when the convention was concluded in 1982, President Reagan was in office. The Reagan administration had among its ranks people who were, I call them neoconservatives, who believed that the United States, being such an exemplary power, need not be bound by international law. They feel that they are above international law. And there were others, right-wing ideologues, who objected to part 11 of the convention. They believed that the resources of the deep sea bed and ocean floor should be subjected to high sea freedom, not to unclaw. So there, there was an ideological objection to it. There's also, the, there's also, you know, and, and also in the U.S. Senate, there's something very strange that you probably, we foreigners would not understand. In the Senate, there's something called senatorial privilege. So even, even if one senator has an objection to a treaty, his colleagues, out of respect for him or her, would not push it, you know? So it's, it's not really democratic, but it's a, it's a custom, you know? They, they res the U.S. Senate is like a club, you know? And uh, there's a certain over courtesy among senators. If, if one of them opposes a treaty, then his colleagues in the Senate are reluctant to push it against his or her wishes. But the bottom line is this. And when my wife asked me, when will the United States become a party to the convention? I replied to her, by quoting Churchill. Churchill once said, we can always depend on the United States to do the right thing after he has tried everything else. So, so in this case, so in this case, the United States taking this rather opportunistic position that the convention has become part of customary international law. So although the United States not a party, the United States can invoke UNCLOS against China, for example, and say to China, you should comply with UNCLOS. And the Chinese will say, why don't you become a party to UNCLOS before you ask me to comply with it? And the Americans will say, UNCLOS has become part of customary international law. So whether or not I'm a party to it, I can enjoy the benefits of UNCLOS. So, I'm sorry to give such a long answer, Eugenia. Well, if, if I may uh, have a very short follow-up. So do they accept the entire UNCLOS as uh, customer international law or some parts of it? I, I think you have to ask the Americans this question. <laughs> uh, 
Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, it, it, I think it's always <coughs> an issue that leaves um, uh, interested people in this area perplexed. I mean, the position of the U.S. towards a convention like UNCLOS, um, uh, or for example, also the uh, Convention um, on the Rights of Children, where the, the U.S. is the yeah. only state that has Oops. not ratified. So there are some, you know, specificities to the uh, to the, the U.S. that have different uh, reasons. I think what uh, Professor Ko attempted to explain um, is probably, uh, you know, a, a very interesting and appropriate explanation. Yeah. Um, I'm going to now um, take a question from the chat. I see that there's um, uh, uh, what you've said in your presentation and also in your answers is starting to generate <laughs> a lot of interest uh, from the participants, which is wonderful. Um, so I'm going to alternate between live questions and oh, okay. questions from the chats um, so as to be um, uh, as inclusive as possible. So we have also a question because there's a few questions on, on UNCLOS still and then a, a, a few questions on soft law, hard law. Um, and, and I have uh, here a question from uh, um, uh, Adrian Lee from Singapore in the chats. Um, thanking you for your rich and concise lecture um, and, and asking um, what you think are the biggest challenges to unclose uh, today, um, looking at the present moment and how do you think unclose could accommodate to today's challenges? So maybe you can address that and, and then I'll go for another question. Okay, um, um, who, who was the person who asked the question? Adrian Lee from Adrian, Singapore. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Adrian. Very good question. Um, I see a few problems. The biggest threat to the integrity of UNCLOS is unilateral uh, interpretation of UNCLOS, which, uh, in my view, not the correct interpretation. So. So the countries which are parties on clause, they choose to interpret the provisions in their own way to suit their interests, you know? So for example, some countries say, okay, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a party to unclause, but you still have to ask my consent before you take me to arbitration, you know? And, and that's incorrect. Or countries which are not archipelagic states still insist on drawing straight baseline when they know it's, you cannot do that. It's wrong, you know. And the most horrible example is over rocks and islands. There is so little integrity in the world. The state practice seems to be that if the feature belongs to me, it's an island. And if the feature belongs to you, then it's a rock, you know. So one of the challenges to unclose is that Countries are unilaterally interpreting their convention in their own way to suit their own interests. And there's a reluctance on the part of states to take other states to, uh, to, to adjudication, litigation, arbitration. You know, it, it's very different from WTO. When countries are very ever ready <clears throat> to take another country to dispute settlement if they have a trade dispute, but I noticed that under UNCLOS, if two countries have a fundamental difference of opinion on how a provision of UNCLOS should be interpreted, there's a great political reluctance to take the other party to, uh, to, to uh, dispute settlement. And my final comment is that in the South China Sea case, I'm sorry to see that UNCLOS and international law have become highly politicized. We are, as I said yesterday or, or Monday in, in the webinar, international law is being, webinized, is being weaponized by the major powers as well as by other countries. So these are some of the challenges I see to, to UNCLOS. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. That's really a question, um, important question, and, and we all have to 
uh, keep paying attention to that um, and, and, and follow it up because I think you know it's a challenge not only to UNCLOS but uh, to international law in, uh, in, in general. So I'm going to take the opportunity now to move back to a live question um, from Pijush Biswas, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing the name right, from India who has asked to um, ask a question live. Uh, Pijush, um, you have the floor. Thank you, and thank you, Professor, for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, I am Pijush, I am from India. My question is, as we were discussing regarding the challenges before UNCLOS, then apart from the United States, Nicaragua, Peru, uh, I think Turkey also and uh, Salvador, they have also not uh, chosen to be a part of this uh, UNCLOS. So I would like to hear some, uh, some points from you regarding on that issue. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pijush, right? Pijush Bishwa from India. Thank you for your question. Yes. Our ambition, of course, was that the treaty would be acceptable to everybody. But in April 1982, when the United States called for a vote, the US wanted a vote on whether or not to adopt the convention. The United States were not the only country that voted against. As you right, rightly pointed out, there were a few other countries that voted against. Why did these other countries vote against? Well, some countries have adopted a territorial sea of 200 miles and it's in their constitution and they were not willing to amend the constitution in order to conform to UNCLOS. In the case of Turkey, as you know, Turkey has a dispute with Greece over the rights and jurisdiction of the Greek island in between the mainland and uh, of the two countries. The Turkish objection basically is that if you give these islands, these Greek islands, the same mar maritime rights to territorial sea, economic zone, continental shelf, this will severely handicap uh, Turkey's claims. I can understand the feeling, but there's nothing we can do about it. It's, as I once told my good friend from Turkey at the conference, what you want me to do can only be done by God, which is to tow away this great <laughs> island away from your mainland, you know? So it cannot be done, you know? So there are different countries that voted against for different reasons. They, they, they do not, they did not do it in order to support the United States. They did it for their own national reason. Thank you, uh, Professor Ko. I, I see in the chat that there are still a few questions about UNCLOS, but I think you have yeah. already covered yeah, a sure. lot. So maybe I'll take a question now uh, from um, um, uh, Pei Xuan Chang <coughs> from China. Um, and it's a question about uh, uh, soft law and hard law. And the question um, uh, states the following. Um, you gave examples of how soft law can become hard law, uh, but can a hard law also be <laughs> softened over time? Um, is there a line between the soft and the hard? Um, if yes, what it is, the adoption by a binding treaty or the application by an international court or tribunal or the states faithfully adhering to it. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's very interesting <laughs> also this perspective of yeah. uh, things evolving the other way around of hard law becoming soft law um, uh, do you have uh, an, any comments to reply to that uh, it's a very very interesting question um, i can think of many examples of soft law becoming hard law but i cannot at the moment think of an example of a hard law that over time became soft law. I don't know whether you, Patricia or Nilofer, can think of an example of a hard law which over time became a soft law. 
Can you think of something? Well, um, I'm not really a concrete example. I might be, you know, if you think a treaty um, that has not uh, received enough attention um, in terms of ratification, I mean, it's not necessarily technically correct to say that it has become soft law, but in the end, yeah. um, it had lost importance. So maybe that could be a way. And, and perhaps maybe I understood also the question which is a very tricky one, very nuanced, um, to um, uh, relate to um, uh, situations of disrespect of the treaty um, in the sense that uh, uh, violations of the treaty or uh, misuse of the treaty, abuse of the treaty provisions could uh, uh, weaken um, uh, the hard law, the hard law provisions. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, tec technically, no, I, I agree with you, um, you know, yeah. strictly speaking. Um, but in, in that sense of being eroded, yeah. um, the relevance yeah. of the hard law, uh, that, that's yeah. how I would see it in a way. Um, maybe I want to um, approach this question in another way. Look at the UN Charter. The UN Charter contains a provision that you should not, a state should not interfere in the domestic affairs of another state. You know? And this is hard law. It's in, it's in the ASEAN Charter and in, in many uh, legal instruments, non-interfering in the internal affairs of another country. This is hard law, but over time, this hard law has been softened by human rights law. You know, the UN has, uh, during Kofi Annan tenure in office, he tried to promote a new legal doctrine of the right to protect. What does this mean? It means that if you, a sovereign state, neglects your duty to protect your citizens, and you commit egregious acts of violations of human rights, other country can intervene to protect your citizen. You know, this is a, a very challenging uh, development. So how do you, in other words, balance sovereignty against uh, human rights? So it's not a case of hard law becoming soft law, but it's a case of hard law becoming less hard. Still hard law, but less hard. And, and there begins to be, uh, a, 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 I wouldn't say compromise, but an interaction between hard law and a new development of soft law that uh, forces you to reinterpret your hard law. So I think this, so during, during the time I was in the UN, I was constantly uh, challenged by this. How do I reconcile sovereignty, non-interference in the domestic affairs of another state with uh, human rights, with our wish to protect the minorities, our wish to prevent states from, uh, from exploiting or neglecting its minorities, or worse, committing uh, egregious acts of violations of human rights. So this is, a, this is an example that comes to my mind. No? It's, it's not hard law becoming soft law, but hard law mm -hmm. becoming less hard. No. Mm. No, thank, thank you so much. It was also in that sense that I was thinking, I mean, there was also um, during the Cold War, for example, you know, um, very important discussions about um, the relevance of Article 2.4 on the prohibition of the yeah. use of force, uh, with Thomas Frank asking who killed Article 2.4 in the sense that you have hard law, but at the same time, um, also through um, uh, the, the, the positions of states and practice of states and yeah. difficulties of the Security Council to um, uh, rise up to the challenge uh, that yeah. you may have the hard law being weakened in that sense. Yeah. So I think this is really an, also a very interesting, yeah. I mean, I prefer, I prefer seeing the evolution from soft law to hard law than the other way <laughs> around. <laughs> uh, but, but it's also true that uh, we have to take yeah. that into account. So there's, uh, I saw before there was, uh, there's an interesting question also about the BBNJ negotiations that you mentioned. Oh. 
uh, from <clears throat> Tikal Freire from the French Polynesia. Again, again, uh, adding to the yeah. diversity of the participants. Um, so about the, the BBNJ negotiations, um, uh, the question um, uh, refers that the negotiations highlight fundamental divides and divergent interests between states, which seem to be very difficult to be bridged. Um, what would it take to conclude the negotiations by the end of the IGC4, the Intergovernmental Conference? Uh, without compromising ambition? I'm sure this is a very difficult question to answer, um, but I, I, I'm certainly you can give it a try. Yeah. So what would it take um, to, to reach an agreement without compromising ambition <laughs> on BBNJ? Uh, <clears throat> fortunately, fortunately, I had lunch, fortunately, I had lunch today with the president of the conference uh, on BBNJ. And I asked uh, my good friend, Rina Lee, uh, will you be able to come to an agreement? What are the competing interests? And she was quite optimistic. She said, it's not easy because there are competing interests. You have uh, the interests of the major developed countries. Other, you have the people very interested in environment, people interested in all kinds of things. But she trying to bring together all these competing interests to agree on a workable compromise. In her view, the compromise must be ambitious, but also realistic. And it must not be an agreement that will be ratified by a, 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 gr a big group of countries, but leave out some of the very important developed countries. So it must be an agreement that works for everybody. And uh, I asked Rina Lee, are you confident that you'll come to a conclusion? She said, quite confident. And I asked her, when will, it, when will it be concluded? She said, either next year or the year after. So that's the news I want to share with you. Well, thank you so much. And I have to say, you're so well prepared that you have lunch with the right person in order to be able to reply to this question. So it shows that you have, you know, full command of everything. Um, but so now we have, we have Andrew Lim's question from Ethiopia, um, and which is about the, uh, what are the major challenges uh, of negotiating and enforcing international law by developing countries, um, which I think it's also a very interesting uh, question. Um, and and uh, yes. it, we would welcome very much your remarks uh, about that. Yeah. Please, Tommy. Yeah, it, uh, yeah it, uh, it's a good question. And I think one of the very important things that the Center for International Law at NUS is doing is to help developing countries in general and the ASEAN countries in particular to enhance their capacity in accepting and applying uh, international treaties and international law. So in, if, I, if I reflect on the situation in ASEAN, very often the countries do not have um, the capacity to, to uh, deal with so many new international instruments. So we, we try to run workshops to make them understand uh, the, the special features, the te technical qualities of the new convention. We try to augment the legal expertise in this country. We try to share with them uh, best practices. So my, my message is centers of international law like CIL should accept as part of their agenda the capacity building of developing countries. So developing countries are able to uh, decide whether it's in their national interest become a party to a treaty, and if they should decide to do so, to have the capacity to implement the treaty. Yeah. Thank you very much. And, and we also hope that uh, this type of initiatives like the A Academy can also contribute yeah. to that capacity 
capacity building and uh, um, uh, although there are disadvantages of the digital world like the ones that we just experienced of participants not having the sound yeah. to be able to ask questions um, at least we hope that uh, you know with all the interactions the training materials um, uh, you um, and, you know everybody will be able to be more prepared um, for negotiating treaties for understanding international law for yeah. um, also I think there's a, a you know an important issue sometimes that we face um, as international lawyers um, to convince like you you said in your initial remarks um, our fellow um, uh, countrymen yeah. <laughs> and countrywomen about the importance of international law. I mean, we, we're uh, quite convinced, but sometimes it's also important that we show um, to the political masters in our own country, you know, the relevance um, of international law and, and, and the advantages. And certainly, I think, you know, from the perspective, uh, we had a long discussion about the rivalry between um, big powers the yeah. other day in the launching event. Yeah. But but you think from the perspective of uh, um, small countries, uh, medium countries, developing countries, certainly international law um, is an important tool to advance the interests and to protect uh, the interests of the country uh, because you, we can't do it by hard power. You have to do it by soft power and the soft power of international law is uh, yeah. extremely important. So I, I don't see any um, further questions um, uh, from in the chat um, or uh, from the participants and uh, uh, we are uh, just approaching at the end of our time slot for um, today. So um, I don't know if you want to say some concluding remarks, Professor Ko, uh, before I uh, close uh, this lecture. Um, so I, my concluding remarks are one, we live in an increasingly interconnected, interdependent world and international law has become even more relevant than before. So it behooves every country, big and small, to study international law, to teach international law, to research international law. And this is particularly important for small country. I've often said in Singapore that for Singapore, international law is both our shield to protect us and our sword when we have offensive interests. You know, we are too small to be able to fight big countries. Uh, the weapon we can use to fight them is international law. So we need strong international institutions. We need strong adherence to international law. We need uh, institutions of peaceful settlement of disputes. So those are my concluding remarks. Thank you, and I think they were excellent and uh, really um, uh, we can end on, on a positive note about the relevance and the importance of uh, international law and, and the continuing efforts to advance international law through international lawmaking. I uh, really thank you for um, your presence today and for your um, excellent remarks um, and also for your generosity in uh, replying to all the live questions and uh, questions in the chat. I'm also very grateful for our active participants yeah. and uh, for uh, being um, with us again today. And um, I look very much to seeing you tomorrow. Um, and um, we have um, today witness uh, from a person who has uh, had the hands on um, on two very important processes and, and tomorrow we'll explore that a little bit more in our lecture about international lawmaking. So thank you so much uh, 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 yeah. Tommy and dear yeah. Professor Ko thank and thank you to all and um, uh, we'll see uh, the participants tomorrow. Thank you so much. Yeah. Have a good uh, rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.